So welcome back to part two. This is where we left off on the precordial leads. So this figure shows the chest leads. The precordial chest leads are unipolar and provide transverse plane view of the heart. They are designated by V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. The V means chest, and each of the numbers represents a specific location on the chest. So the electrodes must be placed, and it's important to avoid placing electrodes directly over a bony area. Okay, so any bony prominence you want to avoid placing in. So that's why you can see here, it's in this intercostal space here, right? So we don't want to put it right on top. We want to make sure it's in that open area there. And you can see the locations here uh, showing the mid-clavicular line, the anterior axillary line, and the mid-axillary line are here. So when you're looking here, clavicular going through, looking axillary, mid-axillary, so we're looking in this area. And we'll be working on this. So performing the EKG in preparation of the room and patient. We want the room to be warm. There should be adjustable lighting so that the light isn't shining. Have you ever been laying in an examination bed and the light is shining brightly right into your eyes? Very uncomfortable. Uh, it needs to be far away from noise and electrical equipment. <clears throat> Sometimes we forget this, that we are taking, you know, an electrocardiograph, and so other electrical equipment can interfere. Position treatment table so it's comfortable and that it's not only comfortable for the patient, but also for you to stand on one side. We want to offer a pillow for under the head and knees and have the patient disrobe to the waist and put on the gown. This one, the opening would be in the front because we're going to be placing leads on the chest, arms, and leg area. And then we're placing the patient into a supine position after the bladder is emptied and the patient has rested for about 10 minutes. This is so that we get a good baseline. We don't want them running right in, laying down, and taking it because we know we'll, we'll have um, different results. This information can be um, taken, so now, now we've roomed the patient and we're going to record patient vitals and also the current medication list that they're on, and we're going to put that into the patient chart. And some of this information sometimes can also be programmed into the EKG or ECG machines, and automatically it's printed onto the recording. It really depends on what the protocol and the machine that you're using for your office. So here we're seeing an example in 25-7. This shows an ECG patient instructions. So they get these instructions and they are able to read through them and it's important when you're giving the instruct instructions and handing them this handout that you attempt to answer all questions and to make the patient comfortable um, and so making sure that they understand the procedure. You want to stress the importance of not moving during the entire procedure and assure the patient that there is no danger of shock. Some patients are nervous about that, so you want to make sure that they know there's no danger of shock, but we need them to stay still. So chest lead locations, here's some demonstrations. Uh, there's 25-8 in your book, you have this. So disposable single-use electrodes are placed on the patient's limb and chest in very specific locations, and this is an example of these disposable here. These are marked locations, but these are the actual disposable electrodes shown. The lead wires from the machine then are connected to the electrodes, and we'll be working on this in class. So here you're seeing the color code, V1 is red, V2 is yellow, V3 is green, V4 blue, V5 orange, 
and V6 purple. How does one know how to make the proper connections from lead wires to from the lead wires to the electrodes? So making the proper connections is facilitated by specific lead markings or color codings on the end of each wire. And it's important that we make note of that. You'll notice here, right arm, left arm, we have white and we have black. And then for right leg, left leg, we have green and we have red. Okay, and those are also demonstrated down here. What should you do after giving the ECG printout to the physician? So once approved, remove the leads and electrodes from the patient, assist him or her into a sitting position, and provide assistance in getting off the table and dressing if necessary. Usually we've talked about this in class. We want to give them their privacy as long as they're able to dress. Um, recording. So before you actually give it to the physician, we have to record the EKG. And this slide is talking about that recording. So most electrocardiographs perform standardization functions and labeling automatically. So you just follow the office protocol when you're performing the procedure, remind the patient to lie still and press appropriate keys on the, uh, to run the EKG strip to get it going. Then you want to review the printout for clarity, and we talked about this earlier in the lecture. It's really important that it looks correct before you do give that to the physician. And then you will give that to the physician and get the patient finished by removing the electrodes and assisting to a sitting position. So standardization is determined by an international agreement so that the ECG can be interpreted in the same way anywhere in the world. So make sure that the machine is correctly standardized. The stylus should deflect exactly at 10 millimeters when standardization button is depressed. And recording of the standardization would be a two millimeter wide rectangle. So when should we perform the standardization? So at a minimum, it should be performed before the first lead is recorded. And some physicians require a separate standardization in each of the individual 12 leads. Sensitivity and speed. Most machines have three sensitivity standards that can be selected. So adjust so that the QRS complex fits properly onto the ECG paper. Usually the speed is about 25 millimeters per second. Why might the speed for an ECG recording need to be changed? So if the patient's heart rate is very rapid or if certain parts of the complex are too close together, you may need uh, to adjust the paper and to run it at double speed or 55 millimeters per second. This extends the recording to twice the normal length. The ECG tracing and the health record. So on there entered into the ECG, you need to have the patient's full name and identification number if the system is used in the facility, uh, the gender, the age, the date and time, and list all medications and supplements the patient takes and variations from normal sensitivity and normal speed. So in your documentation, it should include all of these things. On the ECG paper, typically before you start with the ECG machine, you want to enter in the patient's name, identification number, gender, age, uh, and usually have the date and time. So again, it depends on office protocol and what you're entering into the machine. But into the health record, you should have all of the information on this slide. So interpreting, interpretive EKGs, the computer is equipped with a computer that analyzes the recording as it's being run. There's immediate information on the heart's activity and the patient's baseline data must be entered onto the computer before the 
ECG is reported. So sometimes we have, it does our work for us really, so that it gives information and then the physician double checks that information. Uh, the computer analysis of the ECG and the reason for each interpretation are then printed on the top of the recording and downloaded directly into the patient's electronic health records. So artifacts, what are artifacts? Artifacts are unwanted erratic movement of the stylus on paper caused by outside interference. Electrocardiograph is extremely sensitive to any kind of nearby electrical activity. This is why we want to make sure that it's placed in the correct area. A wandering baseline is usually due to the moving a patient or poor electrode attachment. Somatic tremor is caused by muscle movement. AC or alternating current interference is from other electrical devices and interrupted baseline occurs when the electrical connection has been interrupted. So it's important to know all of these artifacts because it helps you to know how you're going to, it's like your troubleshooting guide basically. It helps you to know what might be going wrong in order to try to fix the artifacts. It's very important for a medical assistant to recognize the causes of the artifact and know how to remedy. So normal appearance of the EKG complexes are the P waves, QRST, I'm sorry, QRS complexes and T waves clearly present? Do they have consistent appearance and do they occur at regular intervals? Are any odd beats present that do not fit in with others? Is the rate normal or fast or slow? Is the rhythm regular or irregular? Why do you think it's important that the medical assistants in a cardiovascular practice be able to recognize rhythm abnormalities on the tracing? It's because the alerting the physician to the presence of an arrhythmia while the patient is still connected to the machine may give the physician the opportunity to observe the patient while the machine is running um, and immediately get some information and they can institute some type of therapeutic or prophylactic intervention and see how that goes. So look, let's look at rate. To calculate heart rate from an ECG recording, you count the number of P waves in a six second strip, so 30 large squares, and multiply by 10. Count the number of P waves in a three second strip. So that'd be 15 large squares and multiply by 20. So this is like when we're talking about how we take the pulse, if we take it for the straight 60 seconds, or do we take it in 30 and multiply by two? So your options are at first, always we want to learn the most accurate, really look at it. So counting the six second strip and multiplying by 10. Uh, you'll get the same or you should get the same result if you do a three second strip and multiply by 20. But again, the six second is going to be the most accurate. To get the ventricular contraction rate, you count number of complete QRS complexes that occur within six seconds and multiply by 10 to get the number of ventricular contractions that occur in one minute. The heart rate also can be calculated by counting the number of small squares between two R waves and then dividing that number into 1,500. So one minute on an EKG strip passes 1,500 small boxes, if you can believe that. So rhythm. Rhythm of a patient's heartbeat is either regular or it's irregular. If a patient's heart is beating in a regular rhythm, each cardiac cycle occurs within the same time frame and individual cardiac cycles occur exactly the same length of time apart. Measure distance between two consecutive RR intervals for ventricular rhythm and you measure distance between two consecutive PP intervals for atrial rhythm. So how does measuring these distances determine the heart's rhythm? 
If the heart's rhythm is regular, each of these intervals measures a 